Mm -hmm. All right, so welcome everybody. Um, hi, Professor David. Um, it's good to have you again. Um, so yeah, uh, we're going to be um, starting now. Please, guys, let's try as much as possible to reduce the uh, rate of um, chatting. Um, it can be really, really distracting. So when it's time to take um, questions, I'm going to notify us of that. I, I'll put it in the text box, but let's try to not do any form of introduction or whatever in the chat section. Um, so yeah, I think we're good to go now, Prof. Thank you very much, sir. Uh, Prof, you're muted, sir. Can you hear me now? Yes. Terrific. Terrific. Well, sorry about that. Um, so what? good to see all of you back. What uh, I want to talk to you about today is the applications of machine learning in cosmology. And I want to touch on, in a sense, two things. Some of the methods in machine learning that we employ to do statistical analyses. And I think a lot of what you'll hear in that discussion is applicable to any problem in which you can do forward modeling, do jet, what we would call generative modeling, and use that when we do not have a likelihood so that we can model universes or model experiments or really kind of any problem in which we have some data and we have a model and we want to ask, how can we, for what parameters does the model best match the data? And this is in the sense a very general problem, but I will look at its applications in my own field, cosmology, um, but I'm hoping some of the lessons will be applicable broadly. And this is a very exciting time in cosmology because we have this incredible uh, proliferation of new data coming in. Uh, we have experiments like the DESI experiment getting positions of uh, tens of millions of galaxies uh, across the sky. The Rubin telescope will in Chile will turn on and will be surveying much of the southern sky, I think roughly a third of the sky every night. It will provide some of the best imaging data or the best imaging data we have uh, from the ground at multi-wavelengths. The European Space Agency's Euclid satellite is in orbit scanning the whole sky. Uh, in a few years, NASA will launch the even larger Roman telescope and it will survey the sky in the infrared. Uh, we are building the Simons Observatory as a, a uh, it was support from the National Science Foundation, the British and Japanese governments in Chile that will be mapping the sky in the microwave. The Japanese telescopes, uh, HS, the Subaru telescope with its uh, Hyper Supreme Cam and Prime Focus Spectrograph instrument is mapping large sections of the sky. Uh, the German Russian Irizita mission is on orbit. Its data taking is temporarily on hold sadly because of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, but as hopefully that will will end and uh, no law and uh, well, this is of course one of its many negative side effects, but uh, there will be X-ray data across the sky. 
And I think what's important for those of you uh, listening in Nigeria and elsewhere is all of these surveys plan after the initial analysis to make all of their data available for everyone to use. I think this is a very important trend in astronomy, and I'm pleased to see it spreading across other fields, that when you do these very large surveys or do these very large experiments, that the data from these surveys and experiments are made available so that scientists everywhere have access to them. And I think this will be very enabling and in the long run of great science worldwide, because it means that a scientist does not have to have access to the largest telescope in the world to do something that is at the cutting edge, because the data from the largest telescopes um, are made available to everyone. And I note that the telescopes like the Hubble telescope and the James Webb telescope um, are open for anyone to propose how to use the data so that anyone worldwide can put in a proposal, here's the object you want they want to look at. And regardless of who proposes, all the data from those major NASA telescopes um, are uh, made available to everyone within six months of the data being taken. But with that background, let's turn to what challenges we have. And, you know, we will have this dramatic improvement in observational data in the next 10 years. We'll be collecting information on the positions and effectively the masses through lensing of millions of galaxies. We will study the microwave background across the same regions of the sky that will enable us to measure the properties through what we call the thermal and TSC and KSC effects, which give us measurements of the gas, integrated gas pressure, the integrated electron momentum across the universe, and the total integrated mass that we see across the universe. We'll be able to map all of these um, over the next 10 years. We will also be surveying the sky with E. Rosita in the X-rays. They will be uh, large H1 surveys. Uh, the SKA in South Africa and Australia will be surveying the sky in, a, uh, in neutral hydrogen. We're going to have all this information. And I would argue that the statistical tools that we have used in the past 30 years are simply not up to the task of doing the analyses of this wonderful data. Those of us who are theorists, who are doing data analysis, will need to improve the set of tools we use to be able to fully extract this data. And I think of the problem as we want, we have some observations and we wanna measure theory. And the way we have done that up to now is measure the two point statistics, the two point correlation function or its Fourier transfer on the power spectrum of the data. And in my last talk, we talked about how we did that with the microwave background, and I showed you an angular power spectrum. That technique works well for observations of the microwave background, where we have um, data in the linear regime where the primordial fluctuations are very well described as Gaussian fluctuations with no higher non-trivial correlation. Uh, correlation functions than the two-point function. However, when we get to large-scale structure, we need to use other summary statistics and other ways of characterizing what's there and what goes on. And otherwise we're missing information. And an example of some of the statistics that we've been looking at are measuring, when you look at the large-scale structure, just don't just look at the density fields, look at the holes, look at the size of the voids. The voids are nonlinear structures, regions in space that are often as large as 30 megaparsecs, 100 million light years across that are devoid of galaxies. 
and their properties provide additional information. So you can see here in this plot from made by uh, Christina Kreisch, one of my uh, thesis students, looking at how well we could measure two properties of the universe. In this case, well, actually three. Uh, let's look at the plot with omega m and m nu right at the moment. Um, plotted on the x-axis is the density of matter in the universe that we infer. Plotted on the y-axis is the sum of the masses of all of the neutrino species in the universe. And you can see the complementarity of different measurements. Um, we're looking at in these plots, let's, don't worry about the abbreviations, but one is a statistic characterizing voids. The other is a statistic characterizing the two point correlation function of the galaxies in the blue. And when you combine these different statistics, you can see that we can extract much more information on the basic properties of the universe. And But to do that, we're going to be need to develop new ways of evaluating our statistics, because in the past, what we relied on was our ability to compute the likelihood function. And now we're going to need to do find new routes to do this. And we're very fortunate to be living in a time at which advances in machine learning are likely to have not only revolutionary effects on our economies, but also uh, have the potential to have, um, you know, revolu uh, really revolutionary effects on areas of science. And I think we've seen this First in structural biology, where the ability to do solve the protein folding problem, which has been a longstanding computational problem, um, is having uh, transformative effects on what people do in structural biology. And I think we are poised to be able to use this in novel ways in physics. Um, here are some of the applications um, I see that we we'll do in cosmology, we're looking at ways we could speed up calculations, do forward modeling, marginalizing over uncertainties in how feedback from uh, star formation and, and uh, quasars, that's what I mean by baryon uncertainty, affect things, and use it as a tool for doing multi-scale physics. And I'll, I'll touch on all of these in the rest of my talk. So what are we doing in machine learning? I think of machine learning, particularly the way we use it with neural nets, of giving us a powerful way to interpolate in a high dimensional space. So let's just start with sort of the classical interpolation problems. If I have a function that I want to represent in one dimension, and I want to sample it with say 10 points, so I can represent the function that takes 10 function evaluations. If that function exists in two dimensional space, that same sensitivity to function variation will require 10 squared points or 100 evaluations. Well, what if I do the same thing in a million dimensional space? Well, that would require 10 to the million function evaluations. That's uh, impossible, right? And if I think about some of the classic machine learning problems, things like you're given lots of pictures of dogs and cats, and you want to train a neural net to separate images of dogs and cats to find the surface that separates the two, machine learning is very effective in finding that surface to separate pictures of dogs from pictures of cats. Now let's think about the functions that we, we're doing dealing with here. If you have, you know, a modern cell phone, here's my new iPhone, um, that um, has a camera that might have 10 million pixels, three colors, 30 million, every image it, that your camera takes 
is a point in a 30 million dimensional space. So if we are classifying images, we are classifying things in a 30 million dimensional space. So I think of as machine learning as effectively a very good way to do interpolation in a high dimensional space. Um, and um, it, that ability will let us do novel things in many other fields. And it, I think it's important to think about machine learning fundamentally as interpolation, or arguably in some ways when you're in such a high dimensional space, you're always doing some form of extrapolation. And I think that's an important lesson to think about when you, if any of you have been playing around with things like ChatGPT, using these large language models with transformers, that they are in a sense doing nothing more than doing interpolation in the space of uh, the written data that they have been scanned in off the internet. And that could often be very powerful in that they can interpolate between effectively different documents that they found and, and word patterns and do predictions. And those of you who have played with it have seen some of the novel things that comes out of that. But in the end, it is always extrapolation and, and interpolation of data. It's not doing reasoning. And this is why it does not have a model of reality that it's using. And this is why these language models will always hallucinate. And I think there will always be um, some limitations in what they can do. But we're not gonna be looking at large language models today at all. Uh, just given the enormous interest, at least here in the US in them, I think it's important to keep, uh, to think about some of the lessons we learn from applying machine learning to physics problems we understand well, when we think about the interpretation of large language models in general. So it is really just curve fitting with expressive curves. And these curves can have millions of billions of parameters, yet are very efficient to train or, or fit to this space. The structure of the networks that we're looking at are um, often, uh, we'll be looking at conformal neural nets where we have input data. We then have a series of parameters we fit in these hidden layers and then output. And these hidden layers have different weights that we assign. And uh, what we will do in <laughs> the whole, of course, a non-trivial thing to teach all of machine learning in 30 seconds, but you can think of it as we will find, uh, we will use um, backpropagation to ask what weights best uh, match the, uh, when we're training on data, the um, given the input, best predict the output. We'll also sometimes make use of graph neural nets whose structures often match the underlying physics. And there are different ways we can use machine learning and in cosmological analyses. One of the ones that I am most excited about in the long term, and not one that I'll talk about much in the rest of my talk, is what if we have known physics? And with known physics, we know how to evolve a simulation from step A to step A prime. One of the challenges in so many fields, whether we're looking at climate prediction where we wanna go from formation of clouds to the scale of climate, oceanography going from the scale of uh, micro turbulence to, to, to ocean flow, to the full scale of the ocean, um, ecology going from trees to forests, is if we understand the underlying processes, what is the best way to coarse grain things so that we can represent the trees with a handful of parameters, the turbulence on small scales with a handful of parameters, uh, star formation if we're cosmologists with a handful of parameters, so we can evolve a much low, uh, things with much lower resolution, compute what we call our subgrid models, so that we can find a way in which we can make a simpler model in a rigorous way where we get the same answer 
whether we coarse grain the initial conditions to our model and evolve it or evolve the model in coarse grain. And I think machine learning has the possibility of offering a route towards that. In any machine learning problem, any problem involving AI, I think it is very important to think about the training data. What we are doing all the time is uh, fitting the network by varying weights to match the training data. And what the network is always doing is learning the features in the training data. So this is quite important because if the training data is not representative of reality, the network will fit the incorrect model. And it is the set of training data that really represents the prior, the assumptions of, of what our prior knowledge is for the analysis. So, and we need to make sure that our training data covers all of the cases. Um, otherwise, if you're asking the model to extrapolate to a reality, to the cases it has not seen before, uh, if you're doing this in our cosmological simulations, as we'll talk about in the next few minutes, that means you're trying to ask the model to work in regimes that it has not seen before and it can sometimes fail. If you're designing a self-driving car and uh, the car encounters a situation that is well outside the training data, well, we'll all, you know, <laughs> it is quite likely the car will crash because uh, neural nets, like most schemes, are good at interpolation, extrapolation uh, outside of its training regime is very difficult. And now what I want to do is look at applying this to large-scale structure. And we'll go back to our same basic problem that we want to solve is, given data, how do we compute the best parameters? And how do we marginalize over nuisance parameters? And our nuisance parameters here will include things like our uncertainties in that subgrid physics. The tool we're going to make use of is what we call simulation-based inference. And for those of you who would like to read more about this or derivation of this, and I think one of the clearest cases to understand for simulation-based inference is a nice paper by Jeffrey and Wandalt that's available on the archive. It's archive number 2011.0599. And it describes what are called moment networks, where we ask, we train the network so that we ask which uh, set of parameters best match our data. So you can, uh, P of X comma theta, you can think of as pairs of, here's our initial conditions, here's the outcome. We have lots of pairs like that. We ask based on those pairs, what weights do we apply to the an, initial conditions? What are the initial conditions that best reproduce things that look as close as possible to the data? And we can generalize that and look at a minimization in the second moment and ask, what given the let's vary the initial data and look given our uncertainties in our observations what range of initial data what range of initial parameters is consistent with the observations and for those of you who would like to make use of simulation based inference in any of your problems where you'd like to ask how can i use machine learning to do statistical analyses on my data. Um, I recommend making use of the SBI toolkit, which uh, makes available really state-of-the-art algorithms um, for applying this to a generalized set of data. And I will be uh, emailing David at the end of this talk uh, a copy of the lectures which you'll make available so he, people could either capture these links now or uh, look them up later. And uh, if you're interested, apply this, look at this SBI toolkit. 
Now, what's key for these toolkits is having lots of training data available. And that, of course, requires lots of computer time. One of the things that we've been doing at my institute here, and I'm uh, the Simons Foundation, of which I'm president, supports the Flatiron Institute, which does work in computational science, is make available training data for anyone to use worldwide. And uh, Francisco Villascuela Navarro, who we call Paco, um, has been leading an effort called Quixote, which is generating large numbers of cosmological simulations for different parameters for training for numerical simulations. And the picture to have in cosmology of these simulations is we run a simulation in a periodic box, starting from the Gaussian random initial conditions that I talked about in the previous lecture. And we evolve it forward so that we go from those initial conditions to this rich structure you see here. And we then compare this rich structure to the galaxy, uh, large scale properties of galaxies observed in galaxy surveys. And if you look at this picture, you'll notice that there are, this is a highly nonlinear structure of the large scale distribution of galaxies or the simulated large scale distribution of galaxies. Uh, you can see that there are large voids dense regions and so on. And those evolve, this is purely gravity in these simulations acting to cause the, the, the growth and the formation of this structure. Right now, uh, Paco and his team have generated 45,000 full end body simulations like that. These explore 7,000 different cosmologies with different initial parameters. Those parameters there are the density of matter, omega matter, the density of baryons, the Hubble constant, or the expansion rate of the universe, the, the initial properties of the initial conditions, the uh, amplitude of fluctuations and their slope, the mass of the primordial neutrinos and the properties of dark energy. And these simulations have generated over, uh, involve over 10 trillion particles over a volume larger than the entire observable universe and contain catalogs of halos and voids and galaxies. And this represents over 45 million uh, CPU hours of data, a uh, uh, CPU hours a petabyte of data. And there've been over a hundred papers written with this actually now, I think close to 150. And uh, all of this data is available uh, publicly and we have some compute power made available. So anyone who would like to work with these and body simulations, start to think about applying this for machine learning or other applications, this is available to anyone um, at, with the link available there. Uh, we have a large team of people who uh, have made this uh, possible under uh, Paco's leadership, uh, involving scientists now um, across the U.S., uh, Canada, Europe, um, lots of people contributing to uh, making this a success. And uh, again, this is one of these things where we've looked at what is the additional information content and this sort of reinforces what I said earlier, that when we go beyond the two-point statistic, we learn new things, we can infer more parameter information. And what this, in a sense, is part of a program of asking, can we figure out the initial conditions from the observations? So what we are doing in these simulation-based inference models is we start with different initial conditions, and you saw we ran 45,000 simulations. We then predict from the simulations the large scale distribution of galaxies and gas, compare that to the observations, and feed that back to ask what were the initial conditions that best represent the underlying data. 
and um, yeah. And not only do we do this in with uh, standard physics, we'll try this in things where let's see if we don't have this clicking. Okay, where we vary the laws of gravity, vary our initial conditions to include non-Gaussianity. Um, change some of the basic assumptions about the properties of the universe so we can use this as ways to probe new physics. Oh, there we go. There's our different simulations. And we can examine how things change in this large scale distribution of matter as we change our assumptions. So where could it go with this, with machine learning? One is, well, these computer simulations are pretty expensive. Can we train a neural net so that it can make, reproduce the simulations without having to run them on a big computer. Train the network so we can do this. And some of the first work on this was done by Shirley Ho, one of the scientists here with her research group. This is work by her student, C.U. He. And uh, what they did was they started with some analytical approximations to the growth of large scale structure then trained a neural net to be able to best fit the difference between the analytical approximation and the full calculation to fit those residuals. The network did quite well. This shows the on the left the error in the unit compared to the best analytical theories we have. You can see the amplitude of the errors on the left all dark blue, basically, are much lower than what we had in analytical theory. Already, we can see progress in using these networks to speed up the calculation. Um, our group has continued to work on this, looking at ways in which we can refine this and reduce the, the residuals between the truth, the full calculation, and our neural net. And what we have shown uh, in a paper on the archive is that what the network is actually learning, for those of you who think about things like partial differential equations, it is learning effectively the Green's function and really the nonlinear Green's functions that um, represent uh, the solutions to the PDEs, right? We have some function space and we are finding good ways of approximating what's going on in that function space. So now let's turn to evaluating large scale structure. We want to effectively think of this as evaluating this large integral where we are integrating over initial conditions, uncertainties in our astrophysics, uh, to be able to derive what is the most likely parameters to produce all the things we see in the observed universe. And one of the first applications of this to real data is the SimBig program led by Shirley Ho, where what you, she does with her team is take those Quixote simulations and ask, how do we check to see if we could find simulations that best match the observations of the Sloan data? How do we best weight parameters? And a key step in this is some data compression. So you look at that big numerical simulation and you compute some summary statistics, things like the two-point correlation function, the three-point function, the void statistics, other summary properties of the data, and ask, take those as outputs, take our parameters as inputs, train a network to go from inputs to outputs, and then, based on the observations, ask what cosmological parameters best predict 
what's seen in the data. And uh, here's a, a recent set of, uh, here's the collaboration group. Uh, this group has produced a series of papers that have appeared on the archive in the last couple months that I think is a nice place to look at for uh, examples of how this is used effectively. And here's the, the observation showing the large scale distribution. Let's see if this movie runs. No, I didn't. Oh. Okay. Hmm. Seems not to be running, my apologies. But the basic idea here is to look at the generated data parameter pairs. So we know how to go from initial conditions to parameters to construct the posterior and join likelihood and parameter distribution for the data. And this shows the outcome of doing this, the ability to measure basic parameters like the density of atoms in the universe, its expansion rate, the slope of initial conditions, the matter density, and the amplitude of fluctuations. This shows the best measured parameters, the most the likelihood surfaces. Orange represents the state-of-the-art analytical techniques, and you can see that the machine learning methods are getting first similar results. We see consistent answers with the previous work done with standard approaches. Um, but the machine learning techniques are already getting slightly better errors. And as these techniques are refined and the resolution improved, uh, we anticipate that this will give us much better constraints on the basic properties of the universe than uh, previous approaches. And here's a, a comparison with previous work. And you can see that the contours are already getting tighter than techniques that uh, do not make use of these higher order statistics and anticipate this will, this will only continue to improve. So what are some of the lessons here? Um, we can see improvements on con uh, parameters often up to factor two that represents taking as much as four times as much data. So it's enormous advance. Um, it's making use of uh, higher order statistics. Um, and uh, I think it's a demonstration of what's what's to come from applying machine learning to large scale structure. In the last few minutes, let me turn to another set of simulations that we've been running here that capture not only uh, the dark matter, but the uh, growth of uh, the effect of feedback and baryon physics on large scale structure. And this is led by uh, three of the scientists here at the Flatiron Institute. And it is a, a cosmology, Camels is cosmology and astrophysics for machine learning simulations. And we're trying to use these simulations to provide uh, useful information for both fields. Here we've run about 10,000 simulations. These simulations are hydrodynamic simulations. They include the uh, fluid, fluid interactions, cooling, star formation with many different inputs. One of the challenges here is that we have many different codes that are people use to simulate galaxy formation. And one of the terrific things that I think was done here is that we made use of seven different codes developed around the world for the simulations. These simulations were done with the different codes, but the same initial conditions so that we can compare them. Uh, again, this is all publicly available with hundreds of thousands of snapshots um, for machine learning. We've done different pairs. Uh, somewhere the cosmological parameters are kept the same 
and they have different random seeds for initial conditions. Some where we keep the random seed the same and vary cosmological parameters. Uh, some where we look at extreme astrophysics to look at its assumptions there and do this for all these different simulations. And these are all, all of these are available. This shows one of the simulations. You can see here in the, the blue, the dark matter, the, the orange is showing the gas. You can see explosions driven from winds from a uh, supernova driving winds into the, the space as supernova and active galactic nuclei explode. Uh, this simu the redshift here is showing the redshift of the universe as the simulation evolves. We're going forward in time as things go forward in redshift. Here you're seeing the simulations evolving further in time. You see more and more supernova and active galactic nuclei winds fill the universe with hot gas. You'll notice that the distribution of gas and hot gas and orange looks very different from the distribution of dark matter and galaxies and stars shown in blue and white. Um, the simulations attempt to bet, capture all of the ongoing physics to produce this. And what we want to do ultimately is compare these simulations to our observations of galaxies or observations of the hot gas and through the lensing our observations of the distribution of matter through the universe. And this next one should show yet another simulation. We've also uh, combined these simulations with um, various analytical models. And again, all of this data, all these simulations are made publicly available. There's an archive paper here describing these simulations and pointing us uh, you to them if you'd like to make use of these. It's describing some of the work we're doing on galaxy clustering and uh, more pretty pictures showing some of the data. And there's some really, I'll get this to open. This link uh, to the this YouTube site uh, will point you to a large number of movies that uh, will give you a sense of some of the things in the uh, that come out of the simulations and uh, encourage you if you have time to go have a look at them and see what's there. Well, what's some of the science that comes out of this? Uh, one of the things we try to do is actually ask, can we learn new relationships from the data? Can we fit things to the data? And here's some work done by Helen Shaw, who is an undergraduate at Princeton, uh, working with this, where we ask, can we learn the basic properties of galaxy halos in the simulations? and come up with laws that fit them. And here we've made use of two steps in this. First is we fit the, we look at the simulations, measure things like the mass of the galaxy, and then try to relate that to observable properties like the galaxy radius, the velocity dispersion of stars, the maximum velocity we see. The first step is to fit a neural net to go from these parameters to the total mass, and then use symbolic regression to derive equations. And another tool uh, that we've been developing, and this is work led by Miles Cranmer in his thesis, Miles is now a faculty member at Cambridge, where he has made available a code that given the out, a neural net, you can then ask, what is it learning? by fitting an analytical function to it. And here's an example of one of the outputs from it, where you could see that the fit, this is from one of the simulations, the predicted mass versus the truth that comes out of these fitted equations, that we are able to describe what the neural net is doing and to kind of learn equations that describing what's going on and how the neural net is learning the relationship between these observed parameters and the total mass 
And when we can look at these relations, we can actually start to try to get some better understanding of why this is working uh, as well as it does. And uh, one of the things we're also trying to make use of with these simulations is understand what things that we infer from the data are robust against um, some of our uncertainties in galaxy formation physics. And here, what was done is we train on different end body and hydrodynamic codes. Um, so we train on one set of simulations and then test on another set of simulations. And these different simulations have different parameterizations of the underlying physics. And by finding statistics for which we get a pretty consistent story, that gives us a sense of what are the observables that are robust against uncertainties and things we don't know, our inabilities to represent our uh, how star formation affects galaxies, how winds from black holes affect galaxies. These different codes have different treatments of this physics. And the fact that we're getting a consistent set of measurements shows the, the power of this data. On the slide, I already went over. All right, let me at this point conclude. So we'll have a little time to answer some of the questions in the chat. What do I hope you take away from this? I think that uh, machine learning can turn out to be a powerful tool for data analysis broadly. In our applications in cosmology, we're showing that we can better capture the systematics in the surveys or uncertainties in the astrophysics of galaxy formation and evolution and extract more information from observations. I think the next generation of analyses of these big upcoming data sets will not be the sort of classic techniques that we've been using since the 1970s, where we merely characterize the two-point correlation function of the galaxies, but we'll make use of machine learning, I think through the form of, of various forms of simulation-based inference to get more out of the data and more accurately treat our uncertainties and get a uh, get more information out while at the same time better characterizing what's going into our analyses. And if we can make use of things like symbolic regression, we use these kinds of tools to get a better understanding of what the neural nets are doing and what are the information we're extracting from the observations. So let me stop there. Um, I'll go now we'll open up the chat and have a look at what's there and uh, take some questions. So thank you. Thank you very much, Prof. Open up the chat here. Why am I? Can I read the questions? Yeah, why don't you read the questions? My screen is freezing at the moment for reasons oh. I don't understand. Yeah, why don't you read the questions and I'll, I'll answer them. Okay, so this one is coming from Jonah Remu. Um, the question is, can machine learning be used in place of the MCN MC and achieve the same results? Is that possible? <laughs> yes, and that's actually one of the things we've been working on is using, um, you know, the MCMC, you should think of it as doing an integral over that likelihood surface. And um, it's exploring that surface and doing an integration by Monte Carlo methods, right? And it is, uh, I think it's good. This is a moment where I wish I was in front of a blackboard. So I'm going to have to uh, just talk my way through this. Let's think about this in one dimension. If I want to do it, I have some function in one dimension and I want to do an integral of it. One way to do this would be sort of 
classical Romberg integration where I take lots of steps and do the integral. That works well in one dimension, but breaks down in higher dimensions. When we have Monte Carlo integration, what we're doing is we are randomly sampling from different values of that function and taking an integral over a function you can think of as what is its average value over that range. And the Monte Carlo integration, you're randomly sampling and then using that to evaluate the function. With machine learning, what you're doing is you're training a network to get an analytical approximation to that function and then explicitly doing the integral. Um, and another way of thinking about it, if you have a training set, is you've trained it on functions nearby that function where you know the answer to the integral and then you're interpolating between those to get the answer. And with good training data or with large enough Monte Carlo simulations, all of these techniques should converge on the same answer. So that's a long way of saying, yes, these are in a sense different ways to get to the same answer. Monte Carlo methods work, I think, best when you're, uh, you have a relatively modest space of parameters. You're looking at uh, a space that is perhaps two to 10 dimensional with parameters in your model. And you know your likelihood explicitly so you can evaluate it. These machine learning methods become powerful when you could only simulate from initial conditions forward. You can't write down an explicit likelihood that describes the outcome of your model analytically. Um, so yeah, uh, we have a question from Barrison. This one is saying, can machine learning methods in cosmology override or be used over the statistical methods in cosmology or are they both efficient in simulation? Well, I think the statistical methods um, we only really know how to use them for things like two-point statistics, where we can write down the likelihood function. Um, I think the way things are going now is we will use both methods um, for the next few years. Um, I think we need to build <laughs> confidence in machine learning methods. I think they are new to most people. I think we need to learn how to use them. And I think having um, cross-checking them against the better understood statistical methods uh, will be important. Um, but I think eventually uh, machine learning will replace uh, statistical uh, methods and analyses. Interesting. So, yeah, <clears throat> I think there's a lot of expression of, I don't know if it is shock or amazement over the um, what was developed by the undergraduate student at Princeton. So I don't know if this is shock or they are amazed. I'm not exactly sure. I think it's probably well, both. I mean, I think it's been great great to see how quickly this is moving. Um, but one of the things I really want to hope I conveyed in my talk, and um, you know, we're, we have just a few minutes left, so I'll uh, when I'm done, I'll, I'll email around the I'll email the links to this. Um, that all of this data is available for anyone to use. So, and what we have made available at a modest level is some compute time where the data is so that if you have things you'd like to try on that data, you can get a binder account and that will give you access and let you play with that data. So if people are interested in trying machine learning techniques on this, I would encourage you to look at uh, some of the papers I referenced in the links and uh, and look at uh, uh, having access to that. I think this at some level, uh, if you've got reasonable um, speed internet access, you can do this from any location. Thank you, Prof. Uh, the thing is, I think we only have about four minutes left. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure we'll be able to go through um, all the questions. Um, 
but I'm going to maybe take one more. Mm. So there's this one. Um, the person is asking that if theoretical astronomy involves running more simulations, does this mean that it applies more complex machine learning techniques than observational astronomy? I think different. So I think, you know, in some ways, I think of observ the challenge of an observational astronomer is given complex data, how do we infer the underlying uh, properties of the universe? As a theorist, we tend to work from the physics we know forward. And um, most applications in machine learning, if you look at read books or things, look more like observational astronomy. You're training on healthcare data. You're training on, uh, you're a company selling clothing. You're training on clothing sales. You're your training set are your measurements. Uh, if you're Facebook doing facial recognition, your training data is a bunch of pictures. There's not an underlying theory of what faces look like. The interesting thing about being a theorist applying machine learning is we have an underlying model of reality. We have a model of the physical universe and we go forward. Um, one of the things our group did was we looked at applying this just to go the, I think of as the classic uh, complex problem in physics, the three body problem right now. Newton and worked out uh, what happens when one planet orbits around the sun. When you have two planets orbit around the sun, we have no exact analytical solution. Much of 18th and 19th century mathematical astronomy was understanding the three body problem. Now we can treat it on the computer. And what we've done is we've used a neural net to extract and model that. So it's really going from uh, theory uh, forward with, with our training data coming from simulation, which looks different from uh, when observers use the data, when they're often, they don't know the answer. What they're often looking for are what say galaxy looks different from all other galaxies they're doing a lot of work in anomaly detection which is another very interesting area of machine learning but uh you know one is um you know you can apply this when you've got tr label training data that's the technique we're using but you could also just um do unlabeled learning where you have data and you learned its characteristics directly from the data set. And a lot of observational astronomy looks more like that. Thank you, Prof. <clears throat> so, oh my God, I mean, our time is up. Time is over. So yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, let me thank you for your attention and uh, uh, hope that I provided uh, um, an, an introduction uh, both to statistical techniques and machine learning and to some of the things going on in cosmology. And it's uh, been a pleasure uh, having the opportunity to be with you. So right. thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Prof. Thank you so much. Um, so guys, uh, we've come to the end of this lecture. I think you can unmute yourself to say thanks to Prof um, from wherever it is that you are. Okay, thank you, Prof. Thank, thank you, Prof. you so much. Thank you so much, Prof, for the lecture. I, I really you, enjoyed it. Thank you, Prof. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Okay. So I'm going to thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much, Prof. Thank you, sir. Bye. Bye.